Welcome to the New Books Network. Good day. I am Boris Karpa. This is the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books in American Studies. With me here is Bill, uh, Bill Steigerwald, who has a background in journalism, and he has written a book which is about a great investigative journalist from the past. The book is titled The 30 Days of Black Man, The Forgotten Stories That Exposed the Jim Crow South. So we're happy to have you with us here today, Bill. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Boris, for doing this. Well, Bill, our audience here is, uh, you know, uh, very traditional in its own ways. And, you know, like in the old-timey Jewish village of Benetevka. <laughs> so we have a traditional question, which we start with. Can you maybe explain to our audience a bit how you have chosen this particular subject for your book? Sure. I, I was a journalist, uh, and I was working at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm from Pittsburgh. It's my hometown. Pittsburgh Post-Gazette was a daily newspaper, a, a, a strong paper in the 1990s. And uh, I came across a man named Ray Spriggle. And he had worked for the Post-Gazette from 1911 to about 1957. And he was a superstar, what I would call a superstar journalist. He had won a Pulitzer. He, had, uh, he was a master of, of going undercover he was an authoritative, powerful writer. He used to be a fiction writer. And um, of his many stories, of his many um, uh, undercover stories that he did, I was most, um, uh, most interested in his 1948 undercover mission into the Jim Crow South. And... Um, he did that. He disguised himself as a black man, and he went into the Jim Crow South of 1948, and there were 10 million black Americans living there at the time under very oppressive and discriminatory and humiliating conditions. And he wanted to see what it was like for himself. He was a, he was a newspaper man, first and foremost. He was not a crusader. He was not a, 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 an early civil rights um activist or anything like that, but he knew it would make a great newspaper story. So he contacted the NAACP, which was then uh, being uh, uh, the executive, um, uh, I don't know what you call me, I forget, the, the head of the NAACP was Walter White, very dynamic, famous man. And uh, he contacted Walter White and he said, hey, I want to do this. I want to go undercover. I need some help and assistance from you because I'll need a, a real black man to guide me around and host me and protect me for a month while I'm down there. And that's what he did. And this, you know, uh, this allows me to talk a little bit maybe about Ray Spriggle's other background, because by the time he did this, by the time he goes out uh, on this undercover mission, on this undercover investigation in the Jim Crow's house. He has done this sort of thing before. He has done some uh, investigations of the organized crime groups in Pennsylvania. He is uh, famously, he has been undercover as a patient in an insane asylum. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit about his background, a a little bit about these previous achievements, which had already, you know, quite a bit, a bit famous already at the time. Maybe you can tell us about this background of his. Yes, and he, he was an incredibly smart uh, uh, man, I think. Uh, early on, he became a journalist, and uh, he was an editor, a very good writer, a pulp fiction writer. And he was on his way to New York City to become perhaps a, a professional pulp fiction writer for a, one of the major magazines at the time. This would have been 1911. And uh, he stopped in Pittsburgh and to visit a friend and he ended up staying in Pittsburgh for the, basically for the rest of his life working at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And, um, he became an editor very quickly, but 
in about 1928, he discovered, there was a big coal strike in western Pennsylvania, so he decided to become a, a coal miner. Uh, a, uh, he pretended to be a coal miner, went to work as a strike breaker in a mine for about a week, and then came back and wrote a front page story about it. And he was disguised. Uh, he, they didn't know who he was, obviously. Um, later on, he, he went into a state mental hospital as a patient. He later went on into state mental hospitals as a guard. And uh, a third time, just as sort of a regular journalist uh, uh, observer, he was, um, he was not afraid to... He had a, I guess, a sort of an actor's uh, or a, or a, a dramatic streak, in the sense that he was always able to go places where he didn't belong and fit in, or actually take on a disguise. In 1945, he, when uh, black market meat sales during World War II were were everywhere in every city, there was black markets uh, in in meat sales. You're supposed to use ration books and everything, and people obviously violated that all the time. He became a butcher, a black market butcher, and he spent almost a month in western Pennsylvania. He really disguised himself that time. He even took out his um, his teeth, I think, in some ways, and he wore, wore a goofy hat, and he drove a truck, and he, and he bought and sold meat in western Pennsylvania uh, illegally, and then wrote a powerful, devastating um article, series of articles that brought congressional hearings from Washington, D.C. to Pittsburgh to find out what was going on. And he was not afraid of authority. He, he knew uh, the U.S. senators from Pennsylvania, but he also knew the, the bookies and the petty criminals and the local cops. So he was quite an amazing character. I've always said that if uh, he had done what he did in New York City, or Los Angeles instead of Pittsburgh, Spencer Tracy would have played him as a uh, as a star reporter in 1950 in a movie because he was very very much um, uh, a, a, an interesting character and and a, and he was not afraid of doing things like going into the Jim Crow South and pretending to be a black man was not a um, not not the you know it, it was dangerous he he. Uh, he was worried about his safety, um, but he had his guide, his host, his protector, John Wesley Dobbs, a real man, a real man, a real editor, I'm sorry, <laughs> a, a real black man from Atlanta uh, who was a prominent political and social leader in Atlanta, uh, who had met FDR, who had uh, been on the radio many times, who gave speeches everywhere. He was a famous orator. He was a he, he also, Mr. Dobbs, was an incredible character. And Walter White of the NAACP uh, connected Spriggle with Dobbs. And exactly, this is May 7th, um, 2000, what is it, 2023. Exactly 75 years ago today, Spriggle met John Wesley Dobbs at Union Station and in, in Washington, D.C., and they took a Jim Crow train to Atlanta to begin Spriggle's 30-day uh, undercover mission in the South. Um, so we, oh, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. It strikes me with what you're saying is, well, he wasn't really a civil rights crusader. He does repeatedly, you know, st stick up for people who are, uh, you know, uh, who are disadvantaged in some ways. He repeatedly, you know, he risks, he goes to some personal risks to go into the asylum system. He, t you know, uh, the mines. He, not while well, he's not really a civil rights crusader, he does go back to these subjects. Uh, to, to these downtrodden people, time and time again. Yes, he was. He was a very well-known celebrity in Pittsburgh. He had also he had won a Pulitzer in 1938 for having exposed that uh, that the Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black uh, that FDR nominated and and had and he was confirmed very quickly that that Hugo Black had been a, a member of the KKK in Alabama. Spriggle wrote that story went down, uncovered, got the papers that proved that Hugo Black had been a member of the KKK, 
wrote front page stories that appeared in virtually every paper in the United States. He won the Pulitzer uh, in 38 for what he did in 1937 to expose Hugo Black. So he um, uh, he didn't he didn't disguise himself then. You know what? I, I'm I'm sorry. I've lost the track of. Uh, I shouldn't have gone back so far, Boris. Um, you uh, asked me what. I I apologize. It seems to me that while this while his uh, Spriggle isn't real isn't per se doesn't self identify as a civil rights crusader, he repeatedly does go uh, he does go to great lengths. He, a lot of his journalism has to do with the plight of people who are um, we would say today underprivileged people who are minors who are uh, asylum inmates. And of course, uh, later people who are suffering under under Jim Crow, he do, he does have this streak in him where he he has this compassion for these people. Yes, I'm sorry. He he um he was famous in Pittsburgh, and he was famous for being a friend of the underdog. And um, again, he was not a liberal; he was a conservative Republican, and uh, he was a newspaper man first and foremost, and that's what he thought of himself as. So he was not a crusader in any way, not a do-gooder in any way. But he was uh, always willing to help the little guy. And he would often um, get letters from from a- average citizens who'd say, hey, look, uh, I have this problem, or there's, there's this corruption in this town in western Pennsylvania, and I need somebody to help me. And Spriggle would often go off and, and do stories to expose the problem or, or, or to, to get to the bottom of the problem in some way. And he, um, he worked as a coal miner, and he worked in those state mental hospitals uh, because he was interested in knowing for himself what was going on in those places. Uh, the state mental hospitals, for instance, were in the newspapers all the time. They were horrible, horrible places where uh, several thousand uh, people who were crazy, people who were sick, people who were uh, sort of uh, just uh, indigent people who had, you know, what we would call homeless people today, people who in, would be living under a bridge, except they were warehoused in these horrible state mental hospitals. Every state had one had several. Pennsylvania had more than a dozen. And Spriggle wanted to know what was going on inside there and what it was like, what the conditions were like, because obviously nobody really knew. And he exposed them in in front page, page one stories, usually in a series, five, six, seven part series. When when he wrote them, uh, when they came out, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette promoted them heavily and they printed up more papers to sell. And Spriggle was a was a very um, uh, profitable <laughs> employee for the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, and they knew how to promote him. And um, so when he went on his trip into the South, he uh, sort of disappeared from the newspaper for almost four months. Because and his byline usually was in the paper a couple times a week. And because he was on his trip and because he had to prepare for his trip. And um, so so uh, on this day, 75 years ago, when he met John Wesley Dobbs in Washington, D.C., Spriggle was wearing a floppy old hat. Uh, He had uh, sort of working men's clothes on. Um, He had gotten at the um, suggestion of Walter White of the NAACP, Spriggle had gone to Florida to get a very, very, very heavy tan. Now, he was a German-American, so he was very light-skinned. And and Walter White said, look, there are many, many different shades of black uh, among the Negro race, and um, all you have to do is get a very, very, very heavy tan and if you say that you are a black man, nobody will challenge you or question you for obvious reasons. If you say you're a black man, then you know, nobody's going to try to argue. No white man is going to try to argue you, argue you out of that uh, position. So Spriggle had tried to dye his skin with um, 
various chemicals and walnut juice and things like that, and he could not he could not change the color of his skin without either making his skin dry up and fall off or 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 not work at all, I guess. So so that's what he did. He he was basically a very well tanned Caucasian American who spent 30 days in the South living, sleeping, uh, traveling uh, as a black man. And of course he had, um, as you said, he had Dobbs as his guide to sort of uh, show him, uh, introduce him to some of the, uh, tr- also, the, also introduce him to some of the traditions of the African American community to have him meet with people locally who could tell him how their lives were like. Sort of he served also as his guide to these things. Yeah. Dobbs was was very well known throughout the South. He was the head of the Georgia uh, Prince Hall Masons, which was the um, black version of the Masons in in America. And so, uh, so Dobbs knew people all across the South, from Savannah to the Delta, in the southern Georgia. And he was a revered and honored man who uh, was was very highly respected. So with Spriggle traveling with Dobbs, Dobbs could have said that um, Ray Spriggle was from Mars, and I think people would, would believe him. He was that well-respected. And um, uh, so no one, oh, one or two people questioned it and suspected it, but it was very rare occasions which caused no problem. There's one thing which struck me about Ray Spriggle's mission, about his journey throughout the South, and you've been, you've discussed this. It doesn't really have a disguise, per se. It doesn't really change the color. He just has a, gets a really heavy tan, and he tells people, well, well I, I'm not white. And people mostly, as you said, nobody, very few people question it. And of course, partly this is um, because white people they, in the South at this time, they, they can't imagine that somebody would pretend to not be white because it's, right. it's, it's uh, and the fact that they can't imagine it, yes, tells you a lot about the status of uh, African Americans at this time, yes. Yes. Where their position is so, so was, much obviously um... worse. Than, and, but also, it seems to me, and maybe I don't understand, like this, the, you know, of course, uh, the, the boundaries of uh, different, uh, you know, of races are always, you know, blurry, are socially constructed to some extent. Is it is this also the, the, the definition of what it meant to be white or non-white is, uh, were somewhat different in this era? Yes, and, and um, I, I think that um, as Walter White told Spriggle, he said, "There's a there's there are people who are as light skinned as you are who are blacks." Um, Walter White himself had blue eyes and blonde hair and was only one thirty second uh, um, or maybe three thirty seconds black. Uh, it was very strange, but he considered himself a, a Negro. He lived as a Negro and he be- he went on to become the head of the NAACP and really, really put the NAACP on the map. He was the one responsible for hiring Thurgood Marshall and pushing up many, many uh, civil rights cases all the way up to the Supreme Court. But so, so the color, the spectrum of, of blackness was, was quite wide, but for, for blacks, but for white people in the South, um, it was pretty much a, a one drop, almost a one drop rule, I guess. Is that what they had in Germany? And one drop of being Jewish, you you were Jewish. Well, it was pretty much, it was pretty darn close, if not actually the same uh, in the South at the time. And um, you just did not, um, if you were even a little tiny, tiny bit black in color, you had to abide by all the Jim Crow laws and uh, which were, were very petty. Uh, in many cases, but also very onerous and very dis- uh, oppressive and very uh, humiliating. Uh, a black professor uh, would be treated just as poorly under the law 
as a as a poor sharecropper would, a black sharecropper would, and um, the uh, and they were strict about it. That it was not something like, oh yeah, don't worry, uh, you know, it's okay. You can come in and use this uh, elevator, or you can sit on this bench today. Don't worry about it. Um, blacks were separated in every possible way in every public sphere. Uh, and that included elevators and ben- park benches and uh, uh, obviously uh, ball fields. Uh, black kids could not play baseball or tennis with um, um, white kids in a public setting. And uh, and that uh, swimming pool, everything, any any public uh, space was um, was segregated by race in the South. And um, in some parts of the South, obviously, it was, things were stricter than others, but it was, uh, a lot of the local rules were were a little different, uh, you know, but they were minor variations of the, of the premise that blacks and whites could not um, be, not share the same public space. And of course, of course, uh, Ray Spriggle's story isn't just the um, investigation he did, but also after he returned with his reports, he, um, because he was such a professional newspaperman, he also built on this, partly, of course, for self-promotion reasons, but I think also because it was the truth, he had a whole plan, a whole. I think he appeared on some radio shows as well. He made public appearances. He promoted the story very heavily. Yes. Um, newspapers in those days uh, were much better at promoting themselves than they were when I was working uh, in the 80s and 90s. Um, but Spriggle came back. He spent 30 days down there and he, he went from Savannah to the Delta and he met all kinds of people, every kind of class uh, um, of, of black person, rich farmers, uh, sharecroppers who didn't have, probably barely had a roof over their head. He came back and he wrote his, he wrote a 21 part series that appeared in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, very high, heavily promoted. They um, and it also was syndicated nationally to about 15 papers. It was offered to more than 250 papers, at, and only about 15 of them um, took the you know purchased the the series that he wrote and to to reprint. And uh, but it was quite shocking to the country, especially to the white North, white audiences, white readers of newspapers read read or saw virtually nothing, no information about the Jim Crow South. Um, you could go into the Post-Gazette newspaper and you can go back in the archives and Walter White, who was the head of the NAACP, who was the, who had been on Time Magazine's cover in, 19, in the late 30s. Um, his name, I think, appeared like three, it appeared three times in 1948 in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. It just didn't cover anything it was covering Jackie Robinson, the, the famous baseball player, but it wasn't covering the uh, uh, basic uh, problems of the South. I guess rarely in a really gruesome, uh, a really gruesome lynching, they would cover that or mention that. But there, it was virtually, uh, uh, and I guess, excuse the pun, a blackout of, of black uh, news in the white newspapers of the North. So when they read... Spriggle series, which was very powerful, very persuasive, very outraged, and and a first person account of what he saw and what he how he lived and how he what he experienced in the South as a black man as best he could uh, for thirty days. Um, when people read that, they they were shocked because they never they just didn't know the details. I would argue that. You can you can read Spriggle's series now. I, I pre- reprinted a small. I self published a book with with his twenty one part series in it. You can read that today, and it's shocking. Uh, imagine how shocking it was in nineteen forty eight when people knew nothing when the to the whites 
Blacks knew all about it in the North and South. White people in the South knew what was going on. They didn't really care. That's the way they liked it. Their, their nice segregated Jim Crow society, their culture was 70 years old, I guess, in 1948. And that's, they were used to it and they, they wanted to preserve it. But the rest of the country was shocked. Eleanor Roosevelt was shocked. She wrote about it a couple of times in her daily newspaper column at the time in 1948. So Spriggle's 21 part series, as I say, shocked the white North, angered the white South, pleased millions of black Americans and uh, started the first national debate in the in the media, in the national media, which, which at the time was print, uh, newspapers and magazines and radio. TV was not, did not, TV, had, TV existed, but only a couple hundred thousand people in America had TVs in 1948. So Spriggle's account was, was very um, uh, uh, shocking and um, to, to the white north, to the chattering class in New York City, the publishers, he had, he had half, a, he had a dozen publishers trying to get him to write a, you know, to put his series into a book, which he did do. Um, so it was a big deal at the time. And Spriggle uh, was not afraid to promote it, I guess, after his series came out. His series was also carried by the Pittsburgh Courier, the only black paper in, in the United States to carry his series, carried it in full, promoted it on page one of, of its weekly edition every every week. Um, so it his series <clears throat> created a stir from about August 10th to about November 10th when when he uh, Spriggle took part in a rate a national radio debate on ABC went out to more than 200 stations. It was a debate over the future of legal segregation. Um, it was a very popular show at the time and um, it was in New York City. It was it was recorded in front of fifteen hundred people at town hall. It was a big deal, and then it disappeared, <laughs> and then it faded away. And it wasn't until Emmett Till uh, was killed in nineteen fifty five that civil rights came back <clears throat> in a big way, in a major way, in a national way in the media. Which kind of brings me around to a question which I have had when I was reading the book, because you say in the book, well, Ray Spriggle was a great reporter, a great person, but we can't really credit him with changing the conversation all by himself. We can, we should not overestimate him also. That's what you say in the conclusion of your book, and so I would like to ask... You've written this book, which is clearly a book for a lay audience. It's not a, it's not an academic study. It's not a, it's something which clearly you want lots of people to read. And so I'd like to ask you, what is it about the story? What is it that you feel that this is the legacy of this mission that is important for us today? Well, I think that, <clears throat> I think. As I was writing this book, I was also a part-time Uber driver in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and so uh, I would pick up, you know, I picked up literally thousands of people and I would invariably talk about, uh, 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 you know, my book or about race or race relations or whatever, because I was interested in that and yada, yada, yada. But um, I, I realized that, first of all, no one, virtually no one has ever heard of Ray Spriggle's story today. It was a big deal back in 1948, uh, but no one knows about it. And this includes academics this, who've written books about black history and civil rights. This includes journalists who teach uh, in universities. I, don't, I can't tell you how many um, emails uh, I've sent to, to, to journalists, professors, journalism professors and, and historians, academics, saying, look, Please be aware of, of this story. Please be aware of my book, obviously, but this this story. And they they had never heard it before. Or if they had heard of it, they barely had heard of it. And they often confused it with the 
with the 1961 book, Black Like Me. So I realized very early on that people had never heard this story. The more I learned about it, the more amazed I became because, of, first of all, the, the, the story itself, the details of what life was like for blacks, 10 million blacks in the Jim Crow South, was shocking to me uh, and, and amazing to, to, to see the, the detail and the detail that Spriggle wrote about. And then um, not, not only was it shocking, it, I, I realized that it, it had been forgotten, but that the story of a collaboration between a, a very white reporter from Pittsburgh and the NAACP, which was the major black uh, civil rights organization at the time, a collaboration between bl- blacks and a white reporter and a white paper to expose something that was sort of a taboo. No one was writing about it. No one, wa- none of the white papers were writing about it for sure. Time Magazine did an occasional, an occasional story. Maybe Life would do something. There were big, important uh, uh, print uh, publications at the time. But basically, this was unknown to America. So Spriggle does the story. He shocks a lot of people. He creates a big stir, and then it disappears. Well, people today have no idea what was what 1948 was like, and they have no idea of how things have changed. You, you, we heard lots of people in the last couple of years talking about Jim Crow 2.0 or Jim Jim Crow redo and all this other stuff. And you know, compared to 1948, today is much, 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 much better in every way for, for black Americans in the United States. You know, there's no question whether you're talking about uh, voting rights or, or just basic discrimination under the law or, or schools or crime. It's it, what, what 1948 was much worse, much worse. And so the, the impact that Spriggle had immediately was, was, pretty, was pretty big that summer of 1948 the topic of legal segregation and, and what to do about it and what, and to get rid of it was, was in the, in the media it was also in politics. Hubert Humphrey uh, uh, caused to the stir at the 1948 Democrat national convention because he, he made the Democrats uh, include a, a civil rights plank, which caused uh, the Dixiecrats, the Southern Democrats to leave the party and, you know, all that craziness was going on. And then poof, it disappears. Then 1955 comes along and you have Emmett Till and you have Rosa Parks. And before that, the year before that, you have Brown versus Board of Education, which said that um, segregated schools or segregated, I guess, public places were were, were, uh, inherently uh, unfair and and, uh, unconstitutional. Um, All of a sudden, America is talking about civil rights again and American media the big media, the national media, film crews from all the broadcast uh, networks and other people were pouring into the South to cover this, uh, what I like to call what used to be the elephant in the American newsroom that nobody was uh, writing about. And all of a sudden it became a huge subject, Martin Luther King, the whole civil rights movement for the next, so from 1955 to 65, I guess, was a huge, huge issue in America and everybody paid attention. But Spriggle was Sprig, what Spriggle did in 1948 was was largely forgotten, and I, and I always felt that that was a shame. And the more I learned about Spriggle and all the amazing things he did, and the more I realized uh, how important his 1948 series was. Briefly, uh, I just wanted to to write this book and make sure that everybody learn the story. And I wrote it like a Sunday. Uh, I used to write long Sunday feature stories uh, where I might get to spend a couple weeks with people and then write a big story about them that would be on the front page of the Sunday section. And um, that's the way I approached this. I am very proud to say there's not a footnote in my book. And I was not, I was not interested in writing an academic book, which, which this story doesn't lend itself to anyway, because I was able to get a lot of Spriggle's papers and some letters and things that um, his daughter had kept 
and I was able, I relied on them, uh, quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I just did it like a real good Sunday newspaper, uh, feature story, uh, similar to the ones I had done many, 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 many times. As I said, uh, as I said, when I started, we are creatures of tradition here. And so we've started with a traditional question. I would like to also conclude with one which is also traditional. Can you tell us, you know, because this is a show about books, it's a show about books, it's a show, it's a show for readers. And so I would like, um, I would like if we could talk about what books you are reading right now, perhaps there is something which you could recommend to our audience. Well, um, I think that uh, when I wrote my book, I came across a lot of people, characters, historical characters that I either had never heard of or had knew nothing about, really. And one of the most amazing ones was Walter White, who who ran, uh, who became the executive uh, director, I think, of the um, of the NAACP in the early '30s, and until his death in the late '50s, was a, a dynamic man. And there's a book, there are a couple books written about him, but I thought that um, the one I just read, I, I just finished it a couple weeks ago, really, was was called White lies the double life of walter f white and america's darkest secret and it's by a j bame b a i m e and it goes into a great amount of detail about walter white walter white is one of those characters who there should be movies about him he was unbelievable uh, he, the more you know about him the more you say why haven't we seen a movie i think the real reason we haven't seen the movie is because he was virtually, he looked like a white man. He was black. He considered himself a, a, a Negro, is what he called himself at the time. And he, he lived uh, like a, a black man. And he did amazing work for the black people. And, and he spent his whole life pushing for uh, equal rights. And, uh, and yet, nobody knows anything about him. And I think it's because of the, of the racial thing. He's I don't, you know, Matt, I can't imagine how they would do a, a, a movie about Walter White because, I, you know, I'm a white guy. Walter White was probably looking whiter than I was with his blue eyes and blonde hair at the time. And if you see his picture, you'll understand maybe the problem why he's not as famous as he should be. So I, I thought White Lies by Bame was, was very well written. Uh, strangely, well, not strangely, I was a little disappointed that it didn't include any mention of Spriggle. Despite my efforts, <laughs> Spriggle's name is still left out of a lot of these books that I that I've come across in the last couple of years. Another one is our friend uh, David, and I don't know how to pronounce his name. Is it David Beto? B e i t o. I've never spoken to him. I've corresponded with him. David and Linda Beto, or or b e i t o, and he's written a book called, about another person who there's a lot of black history that needs to be. Um, uh, dis- discovered or, or uh, publicized in, in, in black men and women. Uh, and I think a lot of them are coming to light, but T.R.M. Howard, H-O-W-A-R-D, was a, was a doctor, an entrepreneur, a civil rights pioneer before, uh, before Martin Luther King came on the scene. So in the 40s and early 50s, he was uh, doing all kinds of amazing things in Mississippi. Uh, he was uh, a, a surgeon, a, a black community leader, successful businessman. And Beto uh, and Linda, his wife, uh, do a good job of going very deep into his, um, his life and, and trying to show that he was one of those... For, as they say, a, for, a great forgotten man of civil rights history. And I think by the time you get to the back end of the Beto's book, boy, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, um, you will agree that here's another guy who, much more controversial, I think, than, 
than uh, than maybe Walter White in the sense that Howard, strangely and not strangely, but interestingly, was a was a um, um, a philanderer, a <laughs> a gambler, and uh, he provided uh, apparently hundreds, if not thousands, of illegal abortions as a doctor, and he had clinics and everything. But uh, if you want drama, if you want controversy, if you want conflict, uh, T.R.M. Howard would make a great movie too. Uh, he was an incredible guy. So those two books, and there, there's no end to them. Uh, the, the books that, that come out, both serious academic books, but, uh, you know, the Beto's book has a million, um, as a good academic, he has a, a, you know, hundreds of footnotes, uh, but they don't get in the way of him telling the good, a good story. And, I think A.J. Bame's story about Walter White is a good way to read about White because uh, I guess he has he has a lot of notes at the back, but again, they don't get in the way, and you don't feel like you're reading something uh, for some class. You're reading a, a good story, and that's what I tried to write when I wrote um, my Spriggle book. I wanted to just tell the story uh, and uh, as well as I could and remind people uh, today and young kids, especially young black kids, white kids, whatever, who don't seem to know anything about 1948, much less uh, Ray Spriggle and what he did, but to remind them how much the world has changed, how, how, how awful it was in many, many ways that aren't appreciated today. Um, but Spriggle, as he said when he came back, and as he wrote... After he had been in the South living as a black man for about three weeks, he was ashamed to be an American. And he uh, was very much a constitutionalist. And he said, look, you know, there's, 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 it's not that complicated. These are American citizens. They should be afforded the, the same protections and rights that every American citizen gets under the Constitution. And there's, there's no reason to delay that another day. And I think it's a great story. He was a great man. His, his partner, uh, and friend, John Wesley Dobbs was a great man. They were both in their sixties. They were both doing something that was, you know, dangerous and good. And they, they, they did their jobs well. And I think that the legacy of Spriggle is that not only did he leave 21 part a uh, 21 part series that is very readable and can be read today and be and is shocking today uh, and I was at 75 years later uh, but he's he's also um, uh, he, he's a he's a historical he's a character who teaches you that um, that as I like to say um, history uh there, there's nothing new in history everything was worse in the past and nothing we think uh, we know about the past is as simple or black and white as we think it is so i think that the more you know about spriggle and what he did the more you realize the truths of those statements which i wrote down and of course the hard work of people like spriggle to you know to make the world a little bit better. Yes. Well, well, I'm uh, again. Thank you for being with us today. And when, uh, not if, when you end up writing another book, you're always welcome on the show again. I thank you, Boris, very much for your time and your interest.